All right, welcome back, and let's continue our journey through Exodus. Um, we're in chapter 23 for our daily bread. We want to have our bread daily, so I want to continue to do this daily. All right, we're going to jump in verse uh, verse 1 here and go through 23, and I highlighted some key points that I want to um, talk about as we go through here, and so uh, let's stay tuned. All right, we're going to pick up reading right here. It says, you shall, you shall not spread a false report. And let me back up a little bit for anyone who just jumped in here. We're talking about uh, in chapter 20, there was the Ten Commandments, but he continues to give them rules, laws and whatnot of how to behave um, now that they're the people of Yahweh. So, um, and, I, and, you, and again, I keep saying this, but I, you really have to appreciate the fact that he did not let them or us just go loose to do as we please, as we see in our own heart is right. Um, by doing so, it's just, can you imagine the chaos? Um, we've seen uh, cities and countries in such a, a state where everyone's just doing what they want. Um, there's a lot of corruption and whatnot. So, But he, he spells it out um, pretty clearly. All right, let's see what we can glean from our lesson from the day. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil. You shall not bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. Let me close that one so we get this bigger. All right, so I, one of the things I liked here is that you shall not fall in, fall in with the many to do evil. It's so, isn't it so evil? Even, isn't it so easy to simply go with the flow? You know, this is what everyone else is doing, uh, whether it be something worldly or it can even be religious. If you're going into a, a church or some kind of organization or any group, it's called groupthink, where people will tend to think the same way just because everyone else is thinking that way. And you're always saying, look, I need you to be sure you're following my principle and, and not just joining in with the many. So don't be deceived in thinking that what's popular is what's right and what's accepted. What's popular has not anything to do with what Yahweh is, uh, accepts as great and um, um, righteous. So, so right here he's also saying siding with the many so as to pervert justice. So again everybody else is saying that. So if you're the jury of 12 people and you're one person who just really convinced this is not right, he says I need you to stand on that conviction. Um, if In verse 4, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey um, going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with you. You shall rescue it with him. Yes, he had to give that command, right? Because if you have an enemy, no, listen to that, an enemy, and in your heart, you're not thinking the most fondest thoughts of that person, maybe. And you're not particularly trying to hurt them, but you're not trying to help them either. That's probably your natural humanistic fleshly feelings. But according to his principles, according, and you could have gleaned this already without him saying this, but I love it that he, he spelled it out. If you see your enemy in need or someone, and in this case, something, an animal in need, you should help them. And how much more so if that enemy has a family? son or daughter or wife or anyone in need I mean you see them and say well, no that's my enemy so you get to see also in the uh, what we call the or many call the Old Testament that his desire for you to love your enemy see when Yahshua in Matthew I believe it was Matthew um, spoke about loving you heard it said to love your neighbors but I say love those who hate you love your enemies this wasn't a new principle remember he came to fulfill what was in the law not to do away with it so you're gonna hear him reiterate the same ideas and sometimes explain them more so what a big piece here because it's easy for believers and I've heard believers say this um, and, 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 uh, and they get patted on the back by other people hey that's just that's just how it is I'm not gonna help them and they did this to me and and he's telling you, if this is how you treat your enemies, how much more your family, how much more your friends, how much more the, your acquaintances who are not your enemies. In verse 6, you shall not pervert the justice due to your due to your poor in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false 
charge. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will acquit the wicked, and you shall for I will not acquit the wicked. Okay, I will not acquit the wicked, and you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear sighted and subverts the cause of those who are unright. You shall not oppress the sojourner. Why? You know the heart of a sojourner. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. I love when he comes back to that. It's easy to help and be compassionate about someone when you know you've been in their shoes. He says, you were a sojourner. You were a stranger in a country. You know what it's like. So it's always good to come back and say, no, I understand what it's like to be in such a position. So to have that compassion. Um, verse 10, for six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie, and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. See, uh, <coughs> Yahweh had a plan built in for the poor. And the plan was the seventh year they're going to eat. So yes, the first six, you do your thing, but the seventh is for the poor. And what they have, the beasts of the field may eat. The beasts even can eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Not only should your land be resting, but your you, your body should be rest. That your ox and your donkey may have rest, and your son and your servant woman, and the alien may be refreshed. You got to listen to these words because it's so easy. I've grown up spending most of my life in the religious realm um, dismissing these types of commands. They're Old Testament. They're for the Jews. Um, nowhere in the Bible is called the Old Testament. That's what we call it. And it's definitely not for the Jews. The Jews come from the tribe of Judah. And he was speaking to all the tribes. Um, as well as sojourners who are among them. Who from Egypt and all over. So this was a command given to to them because it was uh, it was from the Creator who understood all the things that He made. He understood the land. He understood our bodies. Go figure, right? And He knew that the land needed rest. You can overwork the land. People come to find out the very things that Yahweh's already instituted. You can overwork your body. There is a day where he says, I need you to set aside for rest. And I'm not going to get into a discussion or a lesson over that. But he, for one thing we have to uh, come to is there is a day set aside for rest. And we need to observe a day of rest. And the second point is, it's not just any day. He observed the seventh, as you can see here. But on the seventh day, you shall rest. And some like to choose and pick that day, depending on uh, what other scriptures they've seen and, and, and interpret. But I, I would say at the minimum, make sure you're taking that day of rest, which is Sabbath, a Saturday, um, starting at sunset. And this is the calendar that Yahweh has instituted, not the Gregorian calendar that mankind is more familiar with. But let it truly be a rest, um, a day of worship, a day of reflection, a day of not causing others to work. If he didn't want your ox and donkey working, surely he doesn't want anybody else working for you. Um, going out to eat someone working for you or to the stores, uh, which is so easy to do because we're off work for most of us and we want to do something else. But this is a day for them to rest too, and we should be that example. Verse 13, pay attention to all that I've said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods. Don't let it be heard in your lips. Don't even talk about them, he says. And now that's difficult in literal practice. Why? Because all our months um, are named after gods. All of our days of weeks are named after gods. Well, most of the months. Some of them are named after like Augustus, Caesar, August. Um, so, but you get the point. Don't even talk about them. Don't even he, he stay far away from them. <clears throat> Three times in a year you shall keep a feast of me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. As I command you, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. Who came out of Egypt? The people of Yahweh. And I think, again, some, and, I, and myself included for so many years, would think that's for them, that's for somebody else, that's something just for Jews. And we learn again, this is not just Judah. This is not just that tribe. And this, these commands and expectations did not diminish or go away at all. Nor will, um, nor will they ever go away. As you hear the words of Yahshua saying, not a dot or tittle will ever leave. And he's come to fulfill um, this law, not to abolish it in any way. Nor shall appear before me, in, in, nor shall 
appear before me empty handed. You were to come with something in your hand. Notice he didn't say you had to come with this much money or this much food, but you should come with something. What a good practice and principle to have in general if you come into a party. And in this case, it was like a party, but you were coming to eat and fellowship and uh, we do whatever the feast recommended. But it was a time of, of eating for sure. Um, and um, you, you want to have something in your hands. You shall keep the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor of what you shall sow in the field. You shall keep the the feast of in gathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall you shall all your males appear before Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh God. So three times a year all the males should appear. And I wonder sometimes if he's why he said three times a year the males. And I wonder it's because maybe not all the females could go. Uh, women taking care of the families. They had pretty large families. Maybe some were pregnant. Uh, midwives. I, I don't know. And um, you find it in scripture often with Moses leaving. And we talked about this before and his wife meeting up with him another time, but he wasn't necessarily with her the whole time. So she was doing domestic things, not lesser things, which our society tends to deem as lesser. And a lot of women struggle with that, but it's not lesser. They just had a different role in both accomplishing the same kingdom task. But I just wonder sometimes if that's why he said the males are sure to appear before me. You should not offer the blood of the of sacrifice with anything leaven or let the fat of my feast remain in till the morning the best of the first fruit get that the best of the first fruits of your ground shall bring into the house of Yahweh your God bring me the best please <laughs> bring me the don't bring me some kind of like what Cain seems to have done he brought him some while Abel brought him the first fruits um, the best of his first fruits <coughs> um, and of course we don't have the same type of fruit to offer but let's make sure we're giving him our best the best of our time uh, when we're spending it with him in the word and prayer sometimes we can give him what's left over and we don't we, we, we don't section off that time just for him I know um, if you're married your spouse would not be okay with having a time that's overlapped into another time where I'm checking the phone or the kids are involved it's just not the same it'd be nice to have that um, special be the best um, give that best time uh, money whatever it is um, you should not boil a young goat in this mother's milk behold I sent an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you into the place that I prepare for you be careful um, pay careful attention to him and obey his voice do not rebel against him for he will not pardon your transgression for my name is in him Look, love that I'm sending an angel and most of the time Yahweh sends angels and the an angel is a representative and an ambassador if you will of Yahweh it's, it, it literally translates in the Greek and Hebrew as messenger it's someone who is coming to give a message and the message that the angel is given is so connected to it the, the messenger that it's just like Yahweh speaking even though it's the messenger speaking it's kind of like if my daughter um, which happened recently came to me and said so-and-so is doing this and they won't stop so I said go tell so-and-so to stop tell them I said so now if they don't listen it would be as if they're rebelling against me and that's what's the case here and, and that's what happened they came back and I took personal offense I was like I gave my word so but he says look for my name is in him you do not rebel against him how many messengers I wonder are not are, are in our lives giving us uh, messages from Yahweh but we can dismiss it because there's just some person that just not nah, don't dismiss the message because the messenger uh, is the one who sent it but if you carefully obey his voice and do all I say look at that this is a condition because you heard that if but if you carefully obey his voice and do all I say then I'll be an enemy to your enemies and adversary to your adversaries when my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and to the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and I blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them. Don't bow down to their gods and serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly, completely overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. Look, we one thing you'll notice when they overtook land for enemies, he didn't ask them to just come into that land. They were always called to go and completely abolish anything that represented their gods. Anything that they were using for worship. He says, 
if they use that stuff, don't use it for me in worship. Just completely obliterate it. Now, if you're being uh, uh, someone who, who thinks you're being resourceful, you can make a mistake and think, I'm just going to repurpose this thing and use it again. Don't do that. Don't try to repurpose. Uh, I, and so I've had to be careful with this, trying to repurpose songs um, that were not meant for Yahweh. It was meant for something more worldly. You know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of songs out there about relationships. And I'm like, that. Yeah. And, and if someone brought that to my attention, I thought, we have to be careful because I don't. My wife would not be happy with me saying, um, "My old girlfriend gave me this, but I wanted to repurpose it, you know, and give it." He says, "No, no, completely destroy." And none of us would like that <clears throat> on the other end. So let's have that attitude to say, "No, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, completely get rid of everything. I'm not trying to make it up." Uh, I, I keep using the word "repurpose" it so that it's more convenient. Um, so there's a lot of things you can probably think of like that that are not godly, but we want to try to twist it so it can be. Um, some of the holidays like um, Easter or um, even uh, Halloween, um, it, they repurposed them if you really study them out. And again, I don't have the time and space to go into there, but they try to make it so that, you know, it works out. Christmas is one of the hugest ones. Um, really has no foundation. In, anywhere in the scriptures but it was you know we can see how god can come in but it, it's a mess and you don't want to mess around with that because it doesn't matter how we see it but how he sees it and we can see how he sees it um get rid of it all in verse 25 you shall serve yahweh your god and he will bless you bless your bread and your water and i will take sickness away from among you amen i want to highlight that i will take sickness away from i wonder if we get sick <clears throat> because of um the fact that we did not obey this first part carefully obeys the voice and, and do all i say i'm not saying every time we get sick i know we just went through a bout of sicknesses uh with the flu and um I'm hoping that it wasn't because of any sin, but but I wonder sometimes that you know if it's not obedience there. Verse 26: None shall miscarry or um, be barren in your land. I will fully. I'm sorry. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will overthrow and will will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you and I will send hornets before you which shall drive out the Hivites the Canaanites the Hivites um, the Hittites before you from before you I will not drive them out from before you in one year no no no, no, no. I'm not gonna do that why not that'd be nice <clears throat> lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. Oh, this is one of my favorite points. He says, I'm not going to give you all of that at once. Not all that one year. And we could be asking for things that he says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm still, I'm not saying no, I'm going to say, wait, I can't give you all that at once. This is what kind of life I want to have, what kind of income, what kind of family, what kind of wife, husband, what kind of whatever it is. I, he says, no, 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 I can't give that to you. Not in a year. Because if I gave you everything at one time, it'll destroy you. There's some answers to your prayers that if you got it all at one time, it'll destroy you. And we have to be patient and trusting that Yahweh knows what he's doing when he says wait. Or when he says no. Or when he says it's coming, but in increments, as he did here. They literally had to grow. It says until you have increased. Why? Because the animals were going to take over. See, the people that were there now were at least were keeping the animals away. But would they have thought of that? Probably not. Like, give us all the land. I want all this coming to me. Until you have increased and possessed the land, you're going to have to get this, grow into your blessing. So he says, I can't bless you with the next stage until you grow up enough and to get to the next level. So the reason sometimes we're not getting the next thing, the next level of our blessing, where, we, where he's putting in our hearts that he wants to take us there, 
but he has to wait for us to increase. Look at it. Until you have increased and possessed the land. I believe there's times spiritually, guys, where he's waiting to bless you with something amazing, but you haven't increased enough in your character. Your character's still the same. You're still sloppy. You're still not getting up on time. You're still being late. You're still not being a person of integrity, uh, of your word. Um, you're not going back to doing some of the basic things of getting his word and praying and including fasting. Some of these basic things that need to be the foundation of your faith. He says, I need you to increase so I can really give you the blessing. Because if I gave it to you now, and we we know, we've seen people who've been blessed, uh, whether it be in the news or some people close to us. If you get a, give someone too much too fast, it'll destroy them. Give a child a car, a new car, without the cost, and, and they didn't grow into that, they won't appreciate it. Give someone a million dollars and they don't know how to manage um, 10,000, it would crush them, it would kill them. It's like giving a child scissors. Scissors are a very powerful tool and wonderful if used correctly, but given to someone who does not have the skill set and has not grown into that ability will destroy them. In verse 31, and I will set your um, border from the Red Sea to the sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness of the Euphrates. <clears throat> For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them in their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if they, if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Look at that. Sometimes we think we can kind of get over, right? Oh, I can do a little bit. He said, no, if you serve the gods, it will be a snare. Don't let them in your land because you sh it will be a snare for you. So we should trust God in there. So with summarizing, what do we got? We got a lot of different things here, but one of my favorite points is this last point uh, about him increasing as we increase. Um, we talked about the three times a year, um, the day of rest. Uh, making sure we have a time for rest um, and we started out with don't get caught up with the many uh, make sure you're not sitting in the seat of mockers but surrounding yourself with righteous men and women who are trying to please him and not trying to get caught up in popular um, thank you guys for the time and i hope you've enjoyed this daily bread and until next time and y'all we bless you and your family